thank you everyone for coming and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about sort of like non-harvest income sources of agroforestry, which sounds kind of funny, but the whole point of this event in particular was thinking about how you could increase resilience in your farm and how you can increase productivity and income sources without needing to either chop or harvest your tree. So anything else was within the frame of what we could consider. And so today we're going to be talking to Lindsay first, and I'll do the official introductions later, but Lindsay's going to be talking about how the trees can actually help you improve the welfare and on the long run resilience and potentially even abundance that your animals can bring to your farm. Then we're going to move to Craig, who's going to be talking about small nurseries and what does it mean? If it's it for you, is it not for you? Is it a good idea? How do you even put them together? And then at the very end, Andrew is going to be talking about uh, the Woodland Carbon Code and whether it's the right fit for you. So uh, we're going to be, the way that we're going to run it is about 20 minutes each. We're going to have a very conversational uh, approach to things, except for Andy, because he's going to be talking about the Woodland Carbon Code. It's easier if we just follow it with a, with a presentation. But everyone will have time to ask questions. You can either put them on the chat, which is probably the easiest if you're like me and you forget the questions as they go. You also have the, the opportunity to raise your hand and ask a question at the end of either the presentation or the whole event. And as I mentioned, this is being recorded and it will go up in the web. So if you know someone that was interested in coming and couldn't make it, we'll just make that recording available to everyone. So we're gonna get started. We're gonna go with Lindsay and I'm gonna make the formal presentations. So I'm actually opening a document to so make sure that I don't make a mess presenting her. But Lindsay is Lindsay Wistons, and I'm going to brag about the fact that I pronounced it correctly. Um, she's a senior livestock researcher at the Organic Research Center, and she's basically been researching the benefit of trees for animals for a very long time. She's, I know that she doesn't like the word expert, but she's one of the people that know the most about this. So um, she's going to come in now and mute herself, and we're going to start with a wee conversation Again, as I mentioned, chat is all yours. You said both for asking questions and talking to each other. Uh, feel free to share resources as well. So Lindsay, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm really excited about this conversation um, because I think it's, it's an important conversation to have, but also it's just fascinating. And um, I think that because we only have 20 minutes, I'm gonna try to bring it together around different areas where we can see how the trees benefit animals uh, in, in, an, in, their, in their farm environment. So I think that the first aspect, and considering that we're in Scotland, that I would like to ask you about and sort of like hear from you is how, they, how the trees can benefit animals for shelter. Because I mean, if anybody has been outside in Scotland, they'll know that they need it. But also the, the other side, as the summers have got, have got a little bit hotter, uh, also discussing a little bit about um, how sh sh uh, shade is really important as well. So a little bit about those two things. I'll just let you talk and I'll stop lobbying now. So, Yeah, thanks, Anna. Um, and would you mind showing the slide that I sent you? In a I, I really want to start with this particular slide showing uh, what happens to an animal when they're um, thermally challenged. And there we go. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can't see it. I don't know if anybody else can. Anna, you were sharing, but yeah, there it is. Thanks. Okay, so I can see. Oh, excellent. There it is. Yeah, so this is really a, a diagram of what's happening with animals through changing temperatures. So you can see in the middle you've got this thermal comfort zone within the dotted lines. And then just outside of that, you've got the thermal thermo neutral zone. So this is where the animals can maintain their low metabolic rate or, or keep it minimal. And then you start to hit um, up and down with lower and colder, temp uh, lower and warmer temperatures you hit the lower critical temperature and the upper critical temperature. And then note that really a similar thing happens outside of that. 
metabolic rate increases and heat production rises in both of these scenarios. Um, Anna, can you click again, please? No, sorry, Lynn, it's me. It's my computer. It's absolutely chugging away. So if everybody can hear a buzzing, um, it's my computer working overtime. Yeah, apologies all. We'll try uh, to clear it for the recording, so don't worry. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so um, if you press it, hopefully uh, something else will be added to the slide. OK, and again, please. Yeah, OK, so <laughs> if I give it a whack, it'll stop, Andy. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I've tried that before. It just uh, conked out entirely. Um, OK, back to the presentation. So you can see really what happens with food intake. Um, as the animal gets colder, food intake increases, and then the animal gets hotter, food intake decreases. But there's actually very little change within the thermoneutral zone. And what's important to recognise here is when the animal is moving outside of its thermal comfort zone, it starts to make behaviour changes. So this is where the animal would start to seek shade or shelter, depending on uh, the ambient temperatures. Now, oh, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Really with um, shelter, of course, choosing the right breed and the animal is in the right body condition, it has the right coat, for winter conditions um, and really the, the correct production level as well will all enable an animal to better withstand colder temperatures. But it's worth recognising that there are instances when these animals can't cope with these temperatures and where shelter becomes really critical. And we might remind ourselves of the beast from the east in 2018 where 150,000 sheep died in Wales alone you know and these can be quite substantial losses based on um, a lack of shelter for the livestock so if we think about cattle for example if we take a beef animal its lower critical temperature is going to be around zero degrees assuming that this animal is in good condition with a healthy coat. But if we then add rain into this scenario, its lower critical temperature with a wet coat can increase dramatically to 15 degrees centigrade. So that's really quite a shift in that thermoneutral zone. And then if we think on top of that, for every one degree that animal goes below its lower critical temperature, it requires 2% increase in feed, you can quite quickly get into a scenario where you're having to feed an animal up to half as much again for it to maintain its uh, body uh, and to cope with that extra heat production that's required. But bearing in mind that the animal's natural response would be to seek shelter. Um, and this is where trees, and particularly um, hedgerows, uh, woodlands that they can penetrate into, and shelter belts uh, become of really meaningful importance. And it also becomes critical at the beginning of life. So if we consider young stock, then yes, cattle, but also follower animals such as sheep can really benefit from access to shelter. Uh, and we know that by providing good shelter for sheep, we can increase the survival rates of lambs by 30% at least. So these can be really, really meaningful things. And making sure that there's enough shelter also for the, for the ewes to share that space and not cause mismothering um, is also a really critical thing. I can't really hear you very well, Anna. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there it was. I was. I'd moved it. If you have like uh, just a few trees rather than 
a fair amount of trees? Does it have any impact in terms of how the animals behave with each other if they're competing for that space or does it not matter that much? Oh, it matters a great deal uh, in, in several ways. Uh, as I've just suggested, you know, if you have too few trees where you've got used lambing, that can cause a lot of mismothering or no access to space. If you've got, for example, cattle in summertime and they're all trying to crowd under one tree, you can actually increase uh, heat stress because the animals are crowding closer together. And this, it's a similar case also where you've got big problems with flies. So you've got animals crowding together, trying to keep away from the flies uh, and increasing body temperatures through proximity. Yeah. So better to have a few trees like across the fields rather than having lots but too concentrated if you were to choose an ideal situation. Well, that depends what your scenario is, really. I mean, uh, I certainly know of farmers in Scotland and in Wales that grow stands of commercial trees mm -hmm. um, and use them very successfully at lambing and calving time. So you've got um, stands where the animals can penetrate these trees, um, either in really bad uh, weather conditions. So um, I know certainly of one farmer in, in Wales who who grows pockets of um, commercial trees, as I said, and then when it's really bad weather, he's actually built in styles so he can open up the styles and allow his stock to go in and use these areas as living barns while the weather is atrocious um, and allow them to choose for themselves. So the density of trees in certain situations can be of great benefit. If you're looking to produce grass on that same land, if you're looking to produce a food source as well, then clearly that kind of density is not going to be very beneficial. Yeah, so if we, um, if we then think of uh, access to shade, well, you know, I would say that temperature is a relative thing. So if, you're, if you've got livestock that are uh, adapted to colder conditions, then they will also be experiencing heat stress at an earlier temperature, at a lower temperature than animals that are adapted to Mediterranean conditions, for example. So, um, you know, animals in Scotland can also suffer from heat stress. That's good to remember because it's something that coming from um, a warmer weather, I'm like, it's not too bad. But then, yeah, you see even, yeah, my husband who's Scottish can stand over 25 degrees and I'm perfectly happy in that kind of weather. So, yeah, I guess it, it works for animals as well. Absolutely, it does. Yes. And, and I remember, actually, I remember being on North Ronaldsey doing a welfare audit uh, of the North Ronaldsey sheep. And one of the days, it was when they were punding and shearing the sheep. And um, one of the days hit 24 degrees. Absolutely glorious day. But the farmer's wife, who I was following around, the crofter's wife, was sat behind the wall of the pund, simply unable to move. It was just so hot for her. <laughs> you know, I mean, these things are relative. <laughs> yeah. Very charming. But, oh, yeah. just, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, if we if so we shade is important, stuff, <laughs> even for yes. even considering Scottish conditions, it would be really important to consider. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So when we think about shade, uh, and you see that heat uh, rising, instead of eating, of course, now the animals are stopping eating, so they're trying to stop that heat production, and so not eating is one of the ways they're doing it the other way is to redirect blood away from non-vital systems out towards the skin to get that blood to cool down so that their core temperature can remain um, relatively stable and the consequences of having these non-vital systems shutting down can be really quite uh, costly both in terms of animal health but also in terms of production so if you think about the reproductive um, system, what you're getting is uh, animals that have reduced fertility. So if you're wanting to get them in calf, for example, 
it's harder to get that to happen. If they are already in calf, you've got the stopping of nutrients going to that fetus. So you've got a arrested development of the fetus, arrested growth. Mm -hmm. um, and these can be quite meaningful knock-on effects as well. So we, for example, dairy cows that are suffering from heat stress and late lactation, they have poorer quality colostrum, the calves that are born to them are smaller, and if they're heifer calves, you can measure that in milk yield beyond that calf's second lactation when she becomes a cow. So these are really meaningful knock-on effects. Um, and then the other thing that happens is uh, the digestive system gets shut down. Oh. And at least half of the blood, so 50% of the blood that normally services the gut gets redirected and that makes the gut membranes permeable. And what happens there is that the toxins that you naturally find in the gut are then released into the blood system. So aflatoxins, mycotoxins released into the blood system, triggering an inflammation cascade. And again, we find that dairy cows that have suffered from heat stress also suffer more from uh, diseases such as mastitis. Oh, wow. Okay. Really meaningful That's... knock on effects. Yeah, I was I was going to sort of like try to compare it with the cold, but it doesn't really matter. It's not it's not a comparison thing. It's sort of like just try to keep your animal in that optimum sort of like stage and just give them the tools that they need to avoid being out, but outside that and the trees then can help. Them. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and, you know, science um, traditionally has been very focused on productivity. Mm -hmm. So we've had temperature in, um, temperature humidity index to measure heat stress in livestock but in reality it doesn't measure the animal at all it goes from the weather straight to production consequences so they've sort of bypassed the consequences to the animal itself um, there have been attempts more recently to change that so you've, you've got the um, equivalent temperature index for dairy cows that brings in physiological responses of the cow and what they found is that animals are starting to suffer heat stress around 18 degrees centigrade. Now that really doesn't mean that they can't recover from that, they typically can and quite often they can recover at night time. But even then, you know, if you have sustained periods of heat stress, you can find that um, milk yield can go down as much as five litres in a day, even though you're not noticing any particular stress responses from the animal. Oh, wow. So even at mild heat stress, you know, you can be seeing meaningful um, negative changes. And how do, how do the trees help? Is it just because the trees provide a sort of like a little bit of shadow or is it just in general as well, uh, the fact that, that the trees themselves can be a sort of like help the, the cows in terms of their their comfort almost yeah well i mean they help in in several ways actually they they reduce the amount of sunlight getting through so solar radiation can be reduced quite dramatically um, so you you don't have that heat hitting the animal and livestock that are under trees um, have been measured to have a skin temperature of um, four degrees lower than animals without shade so that's quite a substantial reduction but you've also got cooler temperatures because of the trees are, are holding the moisture so natural moisture loss um, from the grasses the respiration transpiration it's it's held so the trees sort of capture it in that space between the between the grass and the canopy which also keeps the air cooler so that's a, a, another benefit that that arises with silver pasture. That's that's really interesting and I, I think it kind of leads us not directly but just thinking about the animals being there by the trees in a cooler space. How does it impact them as well in terms of we've talked about the shade, we've talked about uh, the shelter but there's also uh, an interest in terms of trees as sources for the animals to um, to either feed but also to in general have 
a better space for them to take care of themselves, if this makes sense. It's a space where they can scratch. It's a space where they can potentially have medicine. It's a space where they can just eat things that they wouldn't find in the grass. How do trees complement, um, sort of like, just make life nicer for the animals and therefore on the long, on the long run, um, benefit the farm and improve resilience for the animals and the farm? Yeah, sure. Um, I suppose body care, a, a little bit like um, temperature regulation, is has not been given the attention perhaps that it deserves. But if we if we think of skin as a frontline defence against disease, then we can start to understand why all animals spend some time every day managing their coat or their skin health, and our livestock animals, they do this typically either through licking each other, which cattle do a lot, but really predominantly through managing it through rubbing and scratching. But what we find is that, I mean, if you take, if you take a really artificial scenario, a brush in a dairy system, for example, now in Denmark, they've acknowledged the value of body care in their livestock and it's a legal requirement to have a, a brush for one brush for every 40 cows in a housing system but what we find is that with the brush if you take all of the resources in the housing system most aggression is displayed around the brush because it's a highly valued resource for these animals so if you bring in trees uh, and allow some low slung branches or you know a few lower components then they'll they'll utilize these areas and rub their bodies and and when they do this they can get rid of external parasites they can remove dead hair and dust and dead skin and actually this also has a knock-on effect um, on thermoregulation because if you keep the skin clean and healthy they're better able to manage their um, temperature, body temperatures. So that's one thing that the trees can do. Um, and you mentioned nutrition. Well, there's been some research done uh, worldwide, uh, and this is becoming an increasing area of interest for researchers. But the evidence so far shows that um, the nutritional content of tree fodder is similar to grasses and forbs grown in the same environment. So some of the earliest work was done in, I think it was 1917 in Sweden or Norway, and they were comparing meadow grass in that instance. But even later examples of you know, more recent shows that it compares very well even to alfalfa and Italian ryegrass. Of course, these are very sweeping statements because there will be differences between tree species. And we also have to bear in mind that we're not really considering trees as a replacement, but as a supplementary fodder, because we also have to think about growth rates and recovery rates of, of trees. There's nothing like grasses um, you know, that pretty much reign supreme in terms of of how many times you can harvest grass in a year. Um, but one thing that the trees do bring, which is a real benefit, is higher mineral content. So they've got much deeper roots, they've got much more access to resources that have gone below the roots of, of the grasses. And actually, along with forbs, they also bring um, condensed tannins to the diet and although you know the, the point of condensed tannins from the plant's point of view is to stop herbivory and we always used to think that any condensed tannins were bad now we know better and we know that um, a certain percentage of dry matter in the diet is highly beneficial for livestock and this is both in terms of protein, so it enables um, rumen bypass protein, so mm -hmm. the animals are benefiting from the higher quality protein hitting the intestines, 
and we also know that it's a real benefit in terms of um, parasite control, so gastrointestinal parasites. And there's research that's been done that shows that sheep that have high worm burdens will browse on um, food sources that have high condensed tannin contents and they, they can actually reduce their worm burden by 50% just 50. through their own browsing behaviour. Yeah. Um, and another aspect that they bring, of course, also along with forbs, because we're not trying to pretend that trees are the only sources of these um, additional benefits, but the idea is to create more resilient systems with more um, choices for these animals. Um, and in terms of medicine, um, I suppose let's highlight salicylic acid. It, there are others, but it really is an excellent source uh, as a painkiller. It's not just a painkiller, it has antifungal, uh, anti-inflammatory and um, antimicrobial benefits. So having a, a bit of willow on the farm um, is, is a good thing. Yeah. Uh, That sounds sort of, uh, I love the idea of making sure that, to highlight that it's just trees are going to be one extra asset within your farm. And that's the whole point of discussing this idea is it's sort of like, how do you bring more diversity? But it's not one, it, it's a, it, it has to be a systemic sort of like approach and just planting a lot of trees in itself is not necessarily going to solve all the problems. So just making sure that it's not, that trees are not considered a silver bullet, but a super, practical tool to have in your toolbox if you're going to have happier animals and healthier animals. Nick is asking, which are the best willow varieties for browsing? Is there any specific ones? Is it dependent on the place? How does it work? Well, it depends what sort of uh, system you have and, and how you mean to manage it. I mean, lots are browsable and there are increasing numbers of willows that are being considered as browse. Uh, typically in the UK, um, goat willow is, is a fine browse, but you wouldn't necessarily want to grow that. It's a very low shrubby tree with very low hanging branches. So that might not necessarily be a tree that you would want outside of a uh, a hedgerow perhaps, you wouldn't necessarily want to cultivate that, but perhaps something like um, osier willow, Salix luminalis, is a good fodder tree. It's also very high in zinc. It's actually one of the best trees for uh, zinc. It's a hyper accumulator. Uh, if you're looking for medicine, then purple willow is the highest has the highest content of uh, salicin in, in the bark. I would suggest a variety <laughs> of willows. Um, and again, it depends how you want to grow them and how you want to manage them. So if you're if you're looking for shade also as as a benefit, then you do want a, a let's say a bigger canopy. If mm -hmm. you're looking to incorporate biofuel into your system, you know, then you want more upright growth and, and browse would then be perhaps um, something you could target rather than shade. But having said that, you know, I mean, even biofuels can provide very, very good shelter if they're managed well a long time alongside uh, a rotational system for livestock. That's brilliant. I love that as well. The idea of bringing the fact that, yeah, it can help for your animals, but they have other uses. So uh, I think that yeah. that's really interesting. Rachel, um, the oh, the I think it was the second one, the one that you meant, the, um, the willow that you mentioned before the purple willow. So the willow that had the willow for second. zinc for browse. Yeah. What was the yes. what was the name of that one? That's the osier willow, the Salix viminalis. I swear, people, I'll get it in writing and send it to everyone in the follow-up email. So no worries about that, because if you're like me and the spelling beast is not your thing, you're crying as we speak now. 
<laughs> Thank I mean, you so I'm much, Lindsay. I mean, there's a few questions that are coming in, but we'll keep it for the end so that we can keep the conversation going. Sure. And in the meantime, now that you've told us why we need to have trees, now it's like, how do we get those trees? So um, I'm going to un, uh, unspotlight you and bring instead Craig. Craig's your moment to shine. Are you ready? I don't know about shining, but I'll try my best. <laughs> So everyone, let me introduce you, lovely Craig Shearer. Is that well pronounced? I made an effort with Lindsay and I think I might have used all my well, good pronunciation <laughs> skills in there. <laughs> Answer <laughs> <And> to anything. <laughs> <laughs> so Craig, even though he looks really young and sort of like very glowy at the moment, he has such a long experience working in nurseries and He's currently the managing director of Proven Plants, um, but he in the, he'll tell us more about it in a second. But he's also been um, absolutely crucial in the development of Alba Nurseries. He's been working there for a long time. He's also been a project manager with the seed project with the Woodland Trust. So, I mean, everything from the very seed to the high tree, Craig knows everything there is to know. So we're gonna start um, by asking you, Craig, um, just, I think that it's, it's sort of like a very basic question, but it, it opens a lot of lines of, of discussion afterwards. It's like, what are the benefits of having Scottish source trees for a Scottish process project? And what are the benefits that you can get, but also the challenges of maybe sourcing them, maybe making them grow, maybe the characteristics of the trees. So, the floor is yours. Hey, well, certainly at the moment, I think it is the, the sort of challenges of getting them. I know the, the commercial market just now, it's it's really getting a hold of the trees is the problem. The sort of major tree nurseries are producing large scale for, for the larger scale schemes that are going ahead. So the smaller sort of native projects are maybe taking a little bit of a backward step, but at the moment there's so many new native nurseries sort of popping up, whether that's like ACT, their Gail Community Trust, they've just got a bit of a bit, a money for, for setting up or uh, out in Isla, there's a little school nursery popped up just now, and they're really using it more as a sort of social interaction, uh, training for the kids, getting them to see the whole sort of process from seed collecting to growing. So I think when you're setting up a smaller nursery like that, it is really thinking about why you're wanting to do it. And as you say, it's thinking about the benefits and tree production, it's, it's, it's all on sort of economy of scale. The, the price of plant at the moment, like a bare root plant, is 30 to 40 pence, container grown 40 to 50. So unless you're sort of producing, like, as the big nurseries do, there are millions of trees. You've got your Cheviots doing about 10 million, Mylar nursery, they're one of the biggest ones. They're down based in Wales, but have now moved up in Scotland. They must be at about 30, 40 million trees a year. So it does it sort of makes these smaller nurseries maybe seem not as important, but for the for getting the right genetics getting replanted, I think it's it's the way to go at the moment because the seed collecting side of it is is the tough bit of it. If you're wanting local provenance trees, you're going to have to go out and get the seed, and the the closer you can get it to your final planting site, the better the better that tree is going to survive. Now I'd say yeah, birch is a really good example of that. If you move birch around the country, the survival rate just drops dramatically. So it's something that we've we've really always pushed. I uh, sent earlier the seed zone map. So maybe for anyone that sort of doesn't know the, the provenances, is what I'm talking about there. We could share that so you can see. Just gives you an idea of what we're trying to achieve with the, the different seed zones. Oops. I'm on it. I'm just spectacularly <laughs> clumsy today with this. Uh, there we go. Uh, well, I'll tell you, the, so Scotland's split, well, the whole of the UK is split up into different seed, seed zones there. And it is about putting, collecting your seed from that zone and then growing those trees on and getting them back into that location. So the closer we can get nurseries even in that areas. So there's a lot going on in the West Coast at the moment because it is the sort of area that's sort of been undersupplied over the last few years. You've got your, as you can see, your 201 zone there, all around the Cairngorms. 
So in the past, a lot of forestry has happened in that area. So there's an abundance of seed sources there. And at the moment, we're really sort of out looking at the, the West Coast fo focusing there. You've got your, your 103 zone, Harrison Lewis. It's not only a struggle getting the seed from there, it's just finding the trees there. And that's it's a great example of where sort of that community benefit and sort of individual growers is working really well. We've got a, there's a Frank Stark, he's he started his, his small scale nursery there. He's grown around 30,000 plants. And there's also a community benefit nursery there, a horse adder community group. And through this project we've been doing, we've been sort of pulling them together to, to work away together. And it is so important that you sort of team up with people around your area. And that's been our sort of key focus for the, the Woodland Trust project we're doing just now. So with that, we're getting volunteers going out and collecting the seed. And the seed that we collect from that is then going to be distributed around these smaller nurseries just to give them, really gives them a bit of a saving cost. And it just means your time is always really precious when you're in the nursery game. I've seen Andy Robinson was part of this. So he's he's growing on mull there. And like even he's found that your your time's always just split. You're wanting to do everything. So if we can be sort of getting people out and helping these nurseries collect the seed for them, it's a, a massive benefit for them. And some seeds, some trees just don't produce seeds in years. So it is about sort of when there's a good year, like um, you might have seen two years ago, when it comes to the acorns, we had what we call a mashed year. So there was just a, a huge collection. Maybe not as much as in Scotland as it was in England. England, there were some areas people were just sort of stomping over acorns. And, and in Scotland was good as well last year. But this year, there's only been one major collection done in the country. So you've got um, Forestart, that's the major tree company in the UK. And they managed to get a collection at Morven there, just, just over the water from Mull. And that is the only acorns that will be getting planted around Scotland this year, apart from the ones we got through our Woodland Trust project. Again, with that project, we're maybe getting out and we've, we're getting sort of two kilos from one area, three kilos from another. You get, with the acorns, you get about 300 acorns per kilo. So it does sort of show you the scale we were collecting on. It wasn't huge, but just for the biodiversity to be getting out and getting those ones was just hugely important for us. And as we said, once you've set a nursery up, you can't do everything all the time. So our support to them was hopefully well received. And out of those 300, how many end up being trees? You're probably looking, oak's quite a tricky one to grow because, well, we were growing in containers. So you either grow in containers or you grow bare root. So the bare root, it's lined out in the fields. You, you almost just push two of the, the potato sort of runs together and you make a, a wider bed and then the machine will come along and sort of plant your wee seedlings in there. We do it all in containers. And with the acorns, because they've got such a big leaf canopy, once they open up, they almost crowd out some of the other ones. So you're looking only sort of 50%. So out of that 300, you'd be looking about 150 plants in the end. So it does mean you need to collect a, a lot of seeds. And that collection that happened at Morven, that was uh, for us that got five tons out of there. So it just sort of shows you, I can't do the maths on that to figure out how many trees that should be, but, but lots. We, we can rewatch this and sort of like do the math with more time and sort of like clear brains, but at the moment I wouldn't be able to. <laughs> And certainly so, another species that's tricky to get is, is the, the hazel. Because uh, hazel in Scotland is very different to, to what you get in England. In England you get those, sort of those big cob nuts, whereas when you go out in Scotland they are little tiny, tiny wee ones. So it is, it is hugely important to be getting those collections and making sure we're not sort of spreading species or subspecies from the south up into the north here. But, but it always comes down to if there's a source of hazel, anything will do sometimes. But if we can be looking at how we can get these smaller collections and even looking at um, setting up seed stands. So what we can be doing is going out, collecting from these smaller regions, growing them on, and then hopefully sort of 10 years time, we'll have an abundance of, of hazels from those ones. But like anything with the seed, it's a sort of long game. 
nothing's nothing's for quick quick gain in the nursery world <laughs> that's the beauty of being talking with farmers who understand sort of like long games i think or at least sort of like longer games so it's not going to be a quarter so um so that's really that's that's really interesting and it's sort of like um just since you were mentioning it i might sort of like after this event try to get a few of the names that you've mentioned just for people who are interested to get in touch and see how they can support them even if it's I have a lovely tree outside. I don't, I'm not sure how that would work, but just to make sure that that's happening. But I'm seeing a question by um, Susan that I think would lead us like nicely to the second question that I had, which is uh, Susan's asking about advice because she would like to start a nursery in her croft in its zone 102. I'm not sure. I mean, you probably know. But talking more generically, I think that it's a good opportunity to sort of like discuss You've talked about why we need to set out and why these small nurseries have value, even though uh, they might be challenging in terms of economics or you're not, definitely you're not going to get yourself, you're not going to end up being Tesla by doing this. But, um, but it's, it's one thing to know why. And then how do you do it? Or what are the challenges or benefits or what should you consider when doing them? And I have sort of like a list of practical aspects if you want to if it's easier to go through them, or you can just wing it however you want. But yeah, well, we'll just start chatting away, see where we get. To. We can always go back to. It so I think we would discuss a little bit about how to source material. So a very clear way of sourcing material would be just engaging with your community and sort of like trying to find seeds. Are there other ways that you could source material? Yeah, well, certainly on the on the seed side of things, there's a couple of seed companies out there. Forest Art certainly being the biggest, and then you've got uh, Scotia Seeds on the east coast of Scotland. They are more focused on on wildflowers at the moment, but they do mm -hmm. this stratification. But same Forest Art, if you were collecting seeds, they they could process it for you. Things to sort of again take a, a little bit of your worry away. Because as you collect your seeds, you then need to make sure you get them stratified over the winter. Make sure they get that sort of hot and cold. I always say you almost have to play God on them for a wee while and bring them inside and fill them into this winter time. And then getting them out. Things like birch, you want to soak it up before you then sow it, soak it and put it back in the fridge before you sow. And then other key things you need to, you want to be thinking about your growing medium. So that we're getting more and more so it, a, a better supply of non-peat growing medium just now. I know um, Sinclair's in sort of their their Liverpool way. They're sort of, they're one of the best ones just now. They use a it's a wood fibre, so it's the inner of the tree trunk and it's spun and heated and it creates quite a, like a spongy membrane. So they use a bit of that. They, they use some of the bark and then we use a little bit of coir which there could be arguments that is it any better using coir than peat, but I think the sort of buzzword just now is reducing use of peat. So for myself, I think, yeah, you always have what to think what you're substituting in. That it's, uh, it ticks a box, but we do need to be thinking how you could be. And if you're a small scale nursery, you could be looking at doing your own sort of emulsion, composting, and then mixing that through and things. And, then if you're going for a uh, container growing, there's a few there's a few companies around the UK you can get your containers from. They're, they're, you're looking like maybe the, so the, the sort of smaller plastic containers, they can be down about like three to four pence per growing cell. And then there's a lot of, sort of there's newer, harder plastic ones that will last 10, 20 years, which you may be looking like eight pence per plug. So it is really just, thinking about why you're doing your nursery and for, for what reasons and really deciding how much you want to grow. And I think one of the big things is where your trees are going to end up. I think if you're a sort of, if you have a, a landholder and you've got planting targets of yourself, I think it's a, a great way to make sure you secure your plants is, is growing your own. I think it then becomes a wee bit more difficult once you, if you do want to be selling them, you really, really think you need to be teaming up with projects and sort of being part of something from from the start and you know it's a lot of the smaller nurseries they are in that sort of pocket where they know where their trees are going to go and i think you want to be there because you don't want to spend 
all year sort of growing your tree and then the end of it you don't know where it's going and you've spent all that time time and effort getting it to that stage the, the sort of worry of making sure it's always watered and it's I think tree production it's yeah you don't almost you can't take weekends off through the through the growing season it is really it will be something that's always on your mind but of huge benefit and I think just sort of the, the social well-being side of it to know that you're producing your own and then looking at the sort of niche species a lot of the, at the moment the nurseries you'll get a lot of your birch your alders your rowans but when it comes to sort of native crab apples and native hawthorns and things they're they're a wee bit under provided for so i think that's where if you're producing something yourself that's that's where you want to be thinking right look after those niche ones the the oaks and the hollies that i mean uh, oaks and the hazels that i mentioned are, are a really really good one to get from from your own doorstep and the plant certainly will survive better if you've sourced your local seed Talking about survival, do you need to, once you've planted them, do you need to keep them indoors or is it okay to keep them outside? How does that play in terms of um, probably the resilience of the trees further down the line when you plant them or does it not, does it influence it? Yeah, and I think when people st start their own sort of production, a lot of them can, you can put, you put your own polythene greenhouse in or, and I think people think your tree grows in that all the time, but you want to get the tree used to its its environment. So I think your, your, your polythene greenhouse, that's about getting your plant up and germinated in those first few stages. But then after sort of two months, once you've got it up at sort of five to 10 centimetres, you want to get it outside, get it toughened up, get it used to what someone's going to throw at it, sort of thing. <laughs> and if you keep it inside too long, it just wants to stretch. And then yeah. you've got this long, tall plant and that is not the best for it. So it is, it's thinking about getting it out and if you're sort of trying to produce enough to sort of make a, wee, a living from it means you can multi-crop your tunnel so you almost want to get get it growing get outside get another crop going and then you can even look at sort of growing some crops you we call it a half plus one so you could start it in the greenhouse in june july time get it up and germinated and then give it the full growing season but most of our broad leaves you will if you sow it in march april time you'll have a plant ready for for going in the ground by sort of October something okay. between between sort of 20 and 50 centimeters is really what you're looking for for a size of plant you don't want again you don't want something too big but you don't want it too small that it will get sort of grazed and just get drowned out by the bracken or, or a rabbit has one wee bite of it and it's it's gone don't say the r word <laughs> <laughs> And one last question before we move to Andy, and then there's a few questions that I will attack you with at the end of the presentation, so you have time to sort of like mull the, the answer. But um, I think that's interesting. You've talked about uh, sourcing material, how to grow them. What are the most recurrent problems that you find when you're doing, uh, when you're growing a tree or at that very early stages of the tree? Uh, what should be people paying attention to and thinking, hmm, this might be a problem? It, it'll just your general pests and diseases, your your mildews, uh, your, uh, liverwort is a big problem for us with producing just now, especially in that sort of early stage. A lot of our plants we'll start in mini plugs, so that's a little sort of, uh, sort of five cc cubed container, and you do need, you you need to keep that wet all the time, so you do end up producing that. Uh, you get a lot of liverwort, and depending if you're not wanting to use chemicals it become, can become a real problem for you but even people that are wanting to use chemicals more and more are coming off the market now so it is it's just thinking thinking that side of things do you want to be going down the totally organic side of things but you are going to have problems but i think as long as you sort of know you're going to have those problems and know you might have higher losses then uh, you just sort of you brace yourself for that it's going to happen I'm loving this sort of like warrior approach to growing trees and I can't wait to hear more because there's a few questions but in the meantime we're going to move to you've found why you plant trees you know how to plant trees now how to make them grow and how to get your own trees Andy do you want to tell us what we can get from trees from a woodland carbon code perspective to moment of course. to shine of course and um so 
just let me introduce you really shortly. Um, so people, Andy is a person that you want to talk to if you have any questions about the Woodland Carbon Code. He's Woodland Carbon Code extraordinaire uh, business manager. I think it's the official title, but I would just say just <laughs> no, knowledgeable creature that you can contact at any point. <laughs> So, uh, Andy, just to make sure that we're organized in this thing, because as you've seen when it's a conversation, I can go in really weird tangents. He has actually a presentation for this. So I'll let you go, Andy, and we can have questions at the very end. And then we'll also have all the questions that you pose for both Lindsay and Craig, and any that you present for Andrew, we're going to uh, address them at the very end. So, Andy, off you go. No, marvellous. Thanks, Anna. I've just noticed that um, it's just only meeting organisers and presenters can share. Could you just um, click on the three dots and let me share as well? But while you're just doing that. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> I am a carbon creature. <laughs> that is a nice description. And um, I am, uh, I've been working for Scottish Forestry in the Woodland Carbon Co team for a year now. I've been working for Till Hill Forestry for seven years before that. Thanks, Anna. Um, and so Lynn has dared me to um, try and get through the presentation within five minutes. And so I don't think I'll be able to do that, but I will um, keep it brief. I know everyone's got other things they want to be doing. So um, I am the Woodland Carbon Code, um, Woodland Carbon Markets Advisor um, at the Woodland Carbon Code team. And I will fly through what the carbon code is and all the information that you guys, landowners, farmers, need to know about it. So, first of all, what is the UK Woodland Carbon Code? What's the eligibility for the scheme? What are the obligations for the landowner over and above that of a normal woodland creation scheme? What is the summary of the process for generating carbon units? I'll obviously come on to what carbon units are in a moment. How to sell your carbon units, what the current market is looking like, and then just bits of further information and so I'll also go into how much money you can make from it what the sort of costs associated with it as well but I won't take too long not intending to say more than 15 minutes or so famous last ones so why is the Woodland Carbon Code so first of all the Carbon Code is the UK's government-backed standard for woodland carbon projects allowing for the generation of carbon credits and so what this allows for is you to sell those carbon credits to companies wanting to become carbon neutral, carbon negative, that sort of thing. Um, and it's it's the only UK government backed woodland creation scheme in the UK. So and obviously run by the government, I work for Scottish Forestry. And so it's important because you may be approached by lots of different sort of organisations and you can become carbon neutral, you can become carbon negative, do this and that. It's always useful to know that the only two current government backed standards are the UK Woodland Carbon Code and the UK Peatland Code. So they're the only two standards that are currently endorsed by the UK government. All that means is that the companies when they're making claims of carbon neutrality, if they buy our units, they can make legally backed claims to say they are carbon neutral. Whereas if it was bought through another company that just said, oh, if you, if you plant a tree, you sequester 10 tons of carbon, it's not endorsed by the UK government. So the credits that you're generating, the units that you're generating are equivalent to one ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. Now that equivalent takes into account other greenhouse gases such as methane, nitrous oxide, that sort of thing. And there are two types of units, pending issuance units, PIUs, and woodland carbon units, WCUs. I'll come on to the difference between those in a minute, but it is fundamentally important. So I mentioned already, I work for Scottish Forestry. We base all of our modelling on research and forest research, and we're supported by the Forestry Commission, Northern Ireland, NRW, and the UK Woodland Carbon Code is endorsed also by ICROA, the International Carbon Reduction and Offset Alliance. And that is something that is fundamentally important again, and that's the reason why we're endorsed by the UK government, because we've got their endorsement behind us as well. So it's all building that picture of credibility, which is why companies are buying these units. If they weren't confident, if they didn't trust the units, we're going to be able to allow them to make these carbon neutral claims, they wouldn't buy the units. So that's my job really, not your problem. So just a bit of an outline about what the difference is between a PIU and a WCU. So as you all know, trees take time to grow. So when you plant a tree, it's not sequestered any carbon in, it's not stored any carbon in its biomass in the soil or anything like that. 
it takes decades to do that. Because it takes so long to do that, people often find a real issue with planting trees is the cash flow issue. You're having to wait decades for any return. So what we've done is we've allowed for the generation of these pending units. They're essentially promises to deliver that can be sold before the carbon has actually been sequestered. Think of it as essentially like onward selling timber. So someone saying to you, I will pay you X amount so that when the tree matures and the tree is harvested, I get that timber for the price that I already paid originally. It's a very similar sort of principle. So in the same way, if we were to say, for instance, you had one hectare of land that you were planting and we said over 100 years, we expect that woodland to sequester 500 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent. You register with us, you plant your woodland and then you validate, which is just going through paperwork and that sort of thing. Once you've passed validation, we will give you those 500 units as pending units so that you are essentially saying we are expecting over the next 100 years to sequester 500 tons of carbon. You can now then sell some of them, you can sit on some of them, you can wait, you can do whatever you want with those units. And then over time, at something called verification, every 10 years, a proportion of those 500 pending issuance units will gradually evolve into, they'll gradually be converted into wooden carbon units. So what they're saying is the carbon is actually sequestered, locked in to the biomass of the tree. Now, the important difference between the two of them is what companies can claim based upon them. Now, that's the only reason this market is there is because companies are wanting to buy these carbon units. And so if a company, for instance, had 500 tonnes annual carbon emissions and they said, right, I wanted to be able to make claims of carbon neutrality. If they bought 500 woodland carbon units, they could say this year we are carbon neutral. Whereas if they bought 500 pending issuance units, they're just promises to deliver, all they could say is we are working towards carbon neutrality. And so there's a huge difference in the price that you can sell those wooden carbon units for in comparison to those pending units because they're far more valuable to a company because of the claims that they can make. So that's just the basic principle of what we do. We allow for the generation of these carbon units and for you to sell those units for a profit. So eligibility. So crucially importantly, it's only for new woodland creation. Now, the reason for that is because what we're trying to do is unlock woodland creation that wouldn't have happened otherwise by the generation of these carbon units. So these companies need to know that if they didn't buy these carbon units, the woodland wouldn't be planted. They need to know that they are making a material difference to climate change. If the woodland's already there, them giving money isn't going to make any difference. The woodland's already there. Now, there are conversations and studies going into improving the management of existing woodlands that will help sequester more carbon. And that wouldn't happen unless a company was to invest in potential generation of carbon units that way. But if that happens, great. But at the minute, we are only for new woodland creation. Next of all, there are no minimum or maximum areas in the carbon code, and you can group smaller projects together so you can have up to 50 hectares of smaller projects all grouped together to make the costs of involvement in the code far cheaper. It can include natural regeneration. It's just a slightly different calculation, but based on the same principle. We don't yet include hedgerows and there are other types of soil carbon sequestration, wetlands and that sort of thing that we don't account for at the minute because we don't have the science. But other organisations are looking into it. There's something called the Natural England Investment Readiness Fund that is funding, funding several projects looking at, as I say, hedgerows, sea kelp, uh, salt marsh carbon codes, all of the different types of carbon codes that could help you to manage the land in, in, in a carbon sequestration way and allow you to generate these units to help support it financially. So finally, I've already touched on this, it must be additional. So it must be something, their money must be making a material difference to make a scheme that wouldn't have gone ahead financially go ahead. And so that additionality is something you may have heard of. So we judge this on a couple of tests. We say, look, is there any legal obligation to plant the land? Because if there is, a company giving you money will make no difference <clears throat> one way or another as to whether the woodland is planted. So if there's a legal obligation, compensatory planting, restocking, it's not classed as new woodland creation. You're not allowed to have carbon credits. 
if it is um, financially viable already, so we do this through a cash flow analysis, we basically say, look, you're already making money hand over fist from this wooden creation scheme without carbon, you fail additionality. So there's a lot of stuff going on in this space at the moment, but it's just if you hear about it, that's all it's talking about. So looking at the different obligations you'll have, as I say, over and above that of a normal wooden creation scheme. So in a normal wooden creation scheme, if you had 10 years of maintenance payments, for instance, and your woodland burnt down at year three, you would be under the grant contract obligated to replant that woodland at your own cost or give the grant money back and just say, OK, it failed. I'm giving the grant money back. Once you are outside of that maintenance window, that 10 years, for instance, let's say at year 13, the woodland burnt down you would have no legal obligation to replant that woodland. You could just say that's a real shame, but I'm going to let natural regeneration take its course. If you're in a woodland carbon code scheme, you will have to go in and replant at your own cost. And so it's a really important um, obligation for people to be aware of with wooden carbon code projects. Next of all, you have to verify it every 10 years. I've touched on verification already. You must manage a project as you outlined in your initial carbon calculations in your management plan. And you must, man must manage it to the UK forestry standard, UKFS. So nothing too onerous. It's just important to be aware of the different obligations that are there. So quick summary of how to generate the units themselves. I've already kind of touched on this. But first of all, if you're planning any woodland creation, make sure and, and you are considering the woodland carbon. If you're not, crack on. But if you are considering going down the Woodland Carbon Code route, you must register with us before planting begins. The second you plant that tree without registering with us, you're ineligible. So if there's nothing else you take away from this and you are interested in the Woodland Carbon Code, it's that point. You must register before you plant a single tree. You register, you plant your woodland, then you must validate within three years of that window. Once you've validated, you get your units, your pending issuance units, and then at year five and every subsequent 10 years as a minimum, you must verify your project. And so again, this is a paperwork, sometimes a site visit based approach from validators. We have two validators at the moment, Soil Association and Organic Farmers and Growers, and they will charge you about a thousand pounds for each of these every 10 years. So it's a significant investment, but I'll come on to them in, in, in a minute, the amount of money that can be made and you can decide whether you think it's economically viable to do so. Next of all, looking at how to sell your carbon units and how much money you can make. So first of all, it's very difficult to say how much carbon prices as a general term are worth because there are a variety of factors affecting the value of carbon. So I could sell a carbon unit today for 50 pence or I could sell one for 100 pounds depending on all of these different factors. So every carbon unit isn't the same. And I'll come on to those in a minute. But generally, you are selling your PIUs and your WC, well, PIUs, anywhere between £10 to £30 per unit. I've heard of PIUs being sold for £45 per unit already. WCUs are generally higher than that. But basing on just these figures, £10 to £30 per unit, you're generally going to generate anywhere from 100 to 500 units per hectare. And so you can see from woodland creation, you can quite comfortably generate anywhere from 1,000 to 15 grand per hectare. And this can be on top of the grant schemes. This can be on top of timber income, so long as you pass that additionality test that I mentioned before. Decent amount of money to be made. Every 10 years, £1,000 worth of validation and verification may not be too onerous, but it's your decision. The factors affecting that carbon price very importantly, location. The closer you are to companies, the closer you are to cities, the better, but it's not a prerequisite. It's just because the companies want to be able to get to the woodland, if you're happy for them to do so, to say, look, we supported this woodland creation. We want to put up a sign that just says, this is our company sponsored this woodland creation, that sort of thing. Next of all, the nature of the project, mixed broad leaves often generate slightly higher values than coniferous projects and timber producing projects, but it depends on the company. A company with timber in its supply chain will prefer a Sitka spruce project than a mixed broadleaf one. Very importantly, the vintage of the units is important because when it comes to you selling companies your carbon units, I've already mentioned that those PIUs will over time convert into WCUs. I could tell you when I expect each 
PIU to convert into a WCU because each of them has a serial number and each of them has something called a vintage. So you could give me a PIU and say, right, this is expected to convert by 2030. OK, I can tell you that'll be very valuable because companies are all interested in being carbon neutral by 2030. If it was expected to convert by 2100, it's not going to be worth much at all. So the vintage of those units is hugely important. So be very careful if you are looking at selling your carbon units and someone said, oh, I'll give you 20 pounds per unit, which units they're buying. If they're only buying the ones up to 2050, you're probably getting a raw deal. If they're buying all of the units across the board or a, an average of those units, that's a far, far more reasonable price. So just be very aware of that. Next of all, just the flexibility. The more flexible you are with that company I mentioned coming to site and that sort of thing, the better. The stage of the project you're in, some companies like to buy carbon units off the shelf once you've planted it years ago. Some companies want to buy it pre-planting and help with the design process and help with planting itself, get their CEO, get their customers out and do some planting. And then finally, looking at the associated benefits. So we have something called the Wooden Benefits Tool in the Wooden Carbon Code, and we score out of five these different categories to say what you're contributing on top of the carbon to the wider environment. The higher you score, the more valuable your units. And then finally, just looking at the sort of frequently asked questions. I'm just going to bring them all up because I always repeat myself. Around selling carbon units. So very importantly, you can sell PIUs and you can sell WCUs, but you can't sell them both, if that makes sense. So if you were to sell all 500 of your PIUs, they are sold. You can't then, once they convert into a WC, you can't sell them again because you've already sold them to a company. They're going to make the claim once they convert into a WCU, that's their unit. But if you wanted to sell 250 of your, unit, of your units as PIUs, and then you wanted to sit on the other 250 and sell them once they've converted into WCUs, you're absolutely fine. You can do that. I've already mentioned about the vintage, and you can sell to anybody looking to offset their UK-based emissions. A lot of companies are becoming more innovative with their payments rather than just saying to you, I'll give you 10 grand up front for your carbon. They'll say, I'll give you 200 pounds per hectare per year for the carbon rights for those hectares. We're looking at developing a more automated sales process. At the moment, it's a little bit clunky. If you want to sell your carbon units, you have to go directly to the company. You have to go to a trader. You have to go through different means like that. If we can make a system that allows you just to upload your units, this is the price I want, and then bang, automated sales, that's long-term gains. You can bundle and stack, as I say, at the moment with other sort of grant schemes and stuff, so long as you pass additionality. And there's something called the Woodland Carbon Guarantee in England, but it's not massively relevant here, um, and it's not massively relevant in England, to be honest, but you didn't hear that from me. So next of all, just looking at the current market, like where we are, these figures, so the red ones are giving an idea as to the number of projects, hectares, tons of carbon and units that are current as in December 2021. And then the blue ones are from three months before that. So you can see how rapidly the speed of the units and the interest in the carbon code is is being developed. Don't worry, I can share all of these slides with Anna as well. So I'm more <laughs> um, one mind. Um, and so you can have a look into all of this um, after that. But it just gives you an idea as to how wide ranging the Woodland Carbon Code is now. And then finally, just looking at where you can find source of further information. So first of all, um, have a look on our website. And then next of all, have a call with some of our project developers, which are also on our website. But there are all of these different guys, many of whom you'll already have dealt with. They'll all happily go through the sort of process with you and give you a little bit more information. And that is me. So I'll fire back to you, Anna. And um, I was just over over five minutes, so I've let you all down. Self down. I've let Lynn down. It's. I don't think you're gonna hear the end of it from me. <laughs> so I'm sorry. But it was only a couple of minutes. I'll give you that. That was quite impressive, anyway. That was about six, seven minutes, wasn't it? I did very well. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad that you're having this sort of like relaxed approach because I'm about to read Helen's question, and I want Excellent. to see you deal with this one. And I'm going to read it because Helen is way more um, well versed in the art of speaking and writing than I am. So I'm going to read it. I'm going to just read it as it goes. And the question is about how. Does this work with crofting, uh, tenanted crofts and common grazing? Because the crofters are not the landowners, 
if they're managing the land and hopefully planting the woodlands. Are they eligible for the carbon credits or do they still go to the landowner who's not planting the trees and is not managing them? Susan, is that you? Susan Black, I, I don't know, it just looks like yours is coming on. I don't know. Oh, oh there yes. you go. Perfect. Thanks, Susan. Um, so, yeah, no, it's a really important question and just more generally just looking at tenancies um, and common land comes into it, as you say already. So it depends on your tenancy, really, and the agreement you might have with the landowner. So when we have a tenant, because we've had both, um, when we have a scheme come to us, we require at validation a landowner commitment statement and a tenant, if applicable, commitment statement as well. And so both of these parties have to agree that they're going to manage the woodland as they've outlined in their initial calculations. They're going to replant in case of catastrophe. They're not going to make false claims about the carbon, et cetera, et cetera. So it entirely depends on your tenancy and how you want to distribute those units between you. So if a landowner came to you and said, those carbon units are mine by right, well, that's nonsense. There's they're no one's by right because they're not there yet. And just likewise, if the tenant said, well, I'm planting the trees, they're mine. It's the same sort of principle as when you go through a woodland creation grant scheme. You outline at first who out of the two parties is going to have the different obligations and what happens if someone was to die and the project to fall into the person's hands. What happens if the tenancy runs out? It all depends on the relationship you have with the landowner and the tenant and what legal agreement you strike. So quite often we're finding now they're splitting it. So the landowner is saying, right, because I've dealt with this long, it depends on the tenancy. If it's a very short term tenancy, then it's more likely to go in the landowner's direction. But if you've got one of these really long tenancies and there are so many different types out there, quite often the tenant is taking over them completely. And it's the same with crofting. I'm not a crofter, um, but the sort of conversations I've had with people that properly know about crofting is that some of these can be monstrously long timescales. And so the crofters will 90 percent of the time take the rights and that sort of thing. Um, but there is no real legal precedent and it's the same with mineral rights. And it, this is the same sort of thing when it comes to if you were quarrying the land or who was to who's to get the, the stone. Is it the landowner? Is it the tenant who's to benefit financially? So a very long winded response and probably not the ideal um, answer to you, Helen, but it depends on the contract, but on a contract that you decide to sign between the landowner and the tenant. The tenant may decide, I want to do this. The landowner may be obstinate and say, I'm going to get all the carbon. OK, well, if you do that, then I'm not going to plant it and the, the project stalls. It's a more of a negotiation in my experience. <laughs> you got a thumbs up from Helen. I'm going to yeah. say that's high praise, <laughs> really high praise. Thank you, Helen. So, <laughs> so we still have about say 13 minutes. So what I'm going to do is just make sure that we address at least one of the questions that people have posed for each of the participants and then go, I mean, for the speakers and then go around um, with the new ones. So I'm going to start with uh, Lindsay that has been impressively quiet there for a while. So um, there's a few questions that we can consolidate into one. There's a question around which trees are the best for tenants, but there's also a question around which are good uh, species of trees to avoid or particularly useful. So I guess the tanning question would go into the useful part of of that answer. So what would you recommend, Lindsay? Yeah, well, all trees contain tannins. I mean, they're one of the plant's defense mechanisms against herbivory and because trees are attractive as a food source, uh, they all have tannins in them. Uh, one thing to be mindful of, uh, again, I'll repeat that they don't want too much uh, tannin in the diet uh, and there's also uh, something to be aware of that there are different types of tannins they usually are present all of them are usually present in some quantity so you've got condensed tannins which is what we're talking about here but you've also got hydrolyzable tannins which uh, traditionally have been of less interest and are more likely to be poisonous in smaller amounts but that's not across the board because among the high, uh, hydrolyzable tannins we've also got the allergic tannins which uh, are now being looked at for their uh, medicinal benefits so um, 
again, antimicrobial, anti-inflammatory. So we're learning more and more about the benefits of some of these, what we traditionally thought of and largely still are anti-nutritional factors. Another thing to think about in terms of tannins is that we're learning more and more that there are different condensed tannins for promoting protein bypass compared to those that are beneficial for the gastrointestinal parasite management. Um, and quite a lot of work has actually been done not on trees, but uh, on forbs. So um, particularly Sanfon, um, that's been a big area of research. Uh, yeah, so if you're looking for tannins, um, most trees will have uh, a level that you're wanting to be looking for. And it's worth thinking about also um, in terms of whether you want to feed fresh browse or you want to be looking to grow trees for preserved fodder, so tree hay or silage. Of course, there's, there's a lot to consider within that. But if you dry tree um, and make tree hay, and the tanning content goes down. If you make silage, you maintain the tanning content. <laughs> so there's some things to consider there. Uh, in terms of uh, trees as a food source and avoiding trees, well, you know, it, it's something that requires a lot of consideration because all plants are on a spectrum of what is beneficial and what is poisonous. Um, there are trees that are more obviously poisonous, like yew trees. There are trees that are, let's say, seasonally poisonous, or in certain conditions are more poisonous. So, um, for example, you've got the oak tree, where you'd be really looking at acorns for ruminants. Now, that's not to say they can't eat some, and we have, uh, across the world, we've got some peoples who practice transhumans, where they actively take their cattle and sheep to go and feed on the acorns, but they're managing the content that they're ingesting. Uh, and then you've got points, so I, I wrote in the notes as well about certain trees, for example, like wild cherry, where as far as we understand, they're fine in the fresh state and they're fine in the dried state, but when you're wilting them, the cyanide levels skyrocket and animals that are not used to feeding on wild cherry will go and gorge on it and, and kill themselves. But, you know, all of these things have to be sort of understood in a wider context. So if you've got animals that are, um, what should we say, uh, nutritionally wise in that landscape, they can learn to not overeat these plants. So let's take the wild cherry, the gene as an example. Um, in North America, you've, you've got a high population of wild cherry trees. So breaking branches, stormy weather is, is a regular occurrence. And monitoring, uh, recording what the animals eat has shown that, that cattle will eat a lot of wild cherry but they will go and eat uh, a small amount and then they will intersperse that with feeding on other plants. Um, so overall they're actually eating more cyanide than would kill them but they've, if you like, they've gained this wisdom that they can eat a certain amount and then go away and then go back and eat some more without, without it being harmful. If you talk to Bill Grayson, for example, who um, knows a great deal about uh, using animals for conservation, uh, he will say quite happily that he's seen his animals browse merrily on you. Uh, you know, and we know that deer will browse on you um, partly for medicinal, uh, we think, partly for uh, gastrointestinal parasite control. So it's really about putting these plants in the landscape. You know, you wouldn't necessarily want to plant a whole row of yew trees 
and have no other trees available to the animals, you are likely to be asking for a great deal of trouble. But if you've got one yew tree in a, in a big mix of trees, uh, and you enable the animals to heft to that landscape, uh, and actually, as importantly, you allow young stock to learn from the mothers, then that wisdom gets handed down as well. That's brilliant. I can't believe, it. like the whole cyanide thing is just fascinating and the way that animals can actually learn and, and behave in ways that, uh, again, as you say, it's about giving them one, the tools and two, the diversity for them to be able to uh, to protect themselves and sort of like do that. I'm going to move to Craig for a second. Craig, uh, okay. let me see what I'm going to ask you. You know what? I'm actually going to do this cross conversation and Lindsay had asked, um, how well do uh, willows grow in Scotland and can you propagate them with cuttings? And then I'll ask you a different thing because we have five more yes. minutes, but I think we'll have time. Well, uh, you mentioned Salix bimanalis. That takes root really well from a cutting. You can almost, in some locations, you can just plant, plant rods into the ground and they will take. You'd want to be doing that. So at this time of year, it's a nice time to get them in and they will root up. And then your other species, your cinereas and capreas, they take well from seed. So it's about collecting the catkins before they've dehissed. And you bring those catkins in, give them a bit of heat, and they explode. And then it's got tiny little seed that you... I use a wee hoover to sort of get the seed out of it. But for one gram of salix seed, you get around two to 3,000 seedlings off it. So it is, it's just... Uh, but it's it's getting it, getting it separated is the tricky bit. That's very generous of it. Um, and then a question from Mary, and she'd ask uh, if you have to be regis to register to be an approved tree nursery. She's already a professional gardener and grows and sells ornamental plants uh, and yep. grows trees on a garden scale. But I'm interested in doing this. So, yeah, so what's the process? Uh, so yeah, you apply to FRM, which is a forest reproductive material. You, you become registered with them, and then the big thing is before you go out, two weeks before you go seed collecting. You have to get the landowner's permission before you go and then let the Forestry Commission know you're going to be going on these set dates. Then once you've collected your seed, you then inform them what what collection you got, how many kilos or how many grams you got. Once you're into the larger collections, you get that seed uh, tested. So you'll send it away to one of the testing centres. There's four of them in the UK and they will give you a germination rate on it. And that's really just to monitor that the what is getting collected and what's then getting replanted is monitored correctly. So, so from that, if you get 10 kilos of acorns at 50% viability and you get a seed count, they know how many plants you should have got from that. So it's just to, to, to monitor that we do know what's getting collected and what seed zone and it is going back to the right place. So from there. But I, it's, and it's not a very onerous thing. It's once you've sort of done it all a, a couple of times, it's 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 quite easy. <laughs> First time it can be done, and but I'll, I'll, I'll take your word for it, Craig, because I mean <laughs> it does sound pretty hard going. But um, Andy, this is for you, and it's going to be our closing question, but not to fear people. There's a few questions that we didn't have time to answer. Uh, but I'm sure we can lease Lindsay, Craig and Andrew to answer them and we will include them in the follow up email as well of all the resources and all the comments that you've made on the on the chat, which are quite interesting and I think that are important aspects to consider. Um, so Andy, does this cover agroforestry? Does the Woodland Carbon Code cover agroforestry or does it have to be woodland? Um, it just needs to be able to be classed as a woodland at this point. So it has to be at least 400 stems per hectare for us to be able to validate it and verify it. So, so long as it reaches that threshold, then we include it. Agroforestry is another one of those carbon codes that's currently being developed as well, though. And then a really short one, since you were so succinct <laughs> in that one. Uh, when you're saying woodland, is it a catch-all term for native and non-native species, or is there any difference in the code between native and non-native ones? There's no difference um, for us within the code. All the woodlands have to adhere to UKFS, so the UK forestry standard, and so within there, there are some very strict allowances for commercial or native and non-native species. That sounds great. And people, we have two minutes to spare. 
Come on. So I think that two minutes is about the least amount of time that we're going to need to thank our speakers. So Lindsay and Craig and Andy, just thank you so, so much again. People will, will share their contacts. So, um, I mean, you will be able to pester them directly if you want to ask questions or anything. Not really pester them. Having spoken with them, they're just the nicest people. So I totally recommend if you have questions, reach out to them because you're going to get masses of knowledge and they are willing to nerd it out with you and talk about all these topics, which I know that's not every day that you can go somewhere and be like, can we talk about nurseries or trees and cows or the woodland carbon coat? Feel free, these people are going to be there for you. And um, if you have, if you want to go through us to ask any questions, feel free to, but we'll share in the follow-up email all the information directly. And this recording will go up. So Andy, I can't remember what you said, like, don't say I said it. I will edit it out. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much, everyone. Uh, and thanks for coming. And thank you for coming, especially this late. And speakers, you're the best. Thank you very much. Thank thanks, you, everyone. Anna. Thanks, Anna, for organizing it all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.